1,300,000,000 meters of submarine internet cables have already been laid on the ocean floors. And every year, this length grows. Also, we can send a message, watch a video, or make a call across continents. Over 95% of all intercontinental internet traffic passes through them every day. Stretched through the depths, they cross volcanic ridges, encounter sharks, ships, and even geopolitics. How are these gigantic infrastructures created? Who designs the routes? How are they laid on the seabed at depths of over 26,000 feet? And what happens when a cable is damaged? For the internet to cross oceans, a cable is needed that can withstand pressure, salt water, marine life, and decades of operation without repair. It all starts with the central core, a copper or aluminum conductor, through which the main signal travels. Large ingots of purified metal are melted and passed through drawing machines, which repeatedly pull the material through narrowing dies, reducing the diameter to a few millimeters. At this stage, a perfectly round cross-section is formed, one that has no microcracks or air pockets. After drawing, the wire undergoes heat treatment. It is heated to a precisely set temperature to relieve internal stress and make it more flexible. Then it is cleaned of oxides, often by a chemical method, or using abrasive rollers. The output is a shiny, smooth, almost flawless wire. It is checked automatically for diameter, resistance, flexibility, and surface purity. The wire must withstand kilometers of bending and work without failure, even at depths of several thousand feet. Depending on the type of cable, the wire is either used as a single solid conductor or is twisted from several thinner strands, which increases flexibility and protection against breakage. Once the copper or aluminum conductor is ready, it is immediately fed into an extrusion line, a long machine resembling a tunnel. Inside, polyethylene heated to 482 degrees Fahrenheit, which melts into a thick, viscous cream. The conductor moves along a conveyor and enters the extruder head, where the molten polymer precisely and evenly flows around the metal, like a second body. Every millisecond is important here. Too slow, and drips will form. Too fast, the polyethylene won't have time to adhere. Immediately after this, the cable enters a bath of cooling water, where the polyethylene layer quickly solidifies, tightly enveloping the conductor. The entire surface must be smooth, without a single bubble or crack. This is the first line of defense against moisture. After cooling, inspection. Lasers measure the insulation thickness, and cameras check the surface. If anything is even slightly off, the cable is cut and reprocessed. The next stage is the application of a hydrophobic gel, which acts as an invisible protector. This thick, viscous compound fills all the voids inside the cable, envelops the optical fibers, and creates an internal shield against moisture. In a special chamber, the cable passes through a system of nozzles or rotating heads that evenly apply the gel to the central part and in the space between the fiber elements. The gel resembles a transparent lubricant. It doesn't dry out, freeze, or dissolve in water, even at a depth of 26,000 feet under a pressure of hundreds of atmospheres. Its main property is to repel water. If the cable sheath is ever breached, the gel instantly spreads and prevents moisture from penetrating inside, not letting it reach the sensitive fibers. At this stage, it's also important that there isn't too much gel, otherwise it complicates the further laying of layers, and not too little. Then the protection efficiency drops. Computers precisely regulate the dosage, and operators visually check the filling and uniformity. After application, a short cooling and stabilization. Now the cable is ready to receive its optical heart, the fiber threads that transmit light from one continent to another. These fibers, usually from 4 to 12 of them, are first grouped into modules. Each module is a flexible capsule with several fibers inside, providing additional protection. The modules are very carefully arranged in a spiral around the central conductor. This configuration allows the fibers to bend without tension, especially during winding and laying the cable at sea. To keep the fibers in place, they are fixed in a bedding of gel that was applied earlier. There is no glue, only a tight fit and a flexible structure. It's important that no fiber crosses another, breaks, or shifts from its place. The work is almost like jewelry making, although it's done on a conveyor. Afterward, a continuity check of each fiber. A laser beam is sent through them. Even a micro crack or a bend will cause a failure, and the fiber won't pass inspection. If everything is fine, the structure moves on to the next stage, additional insulation and reinforcement. First, an additional polymer layer is applied over the optical fiber structure. Often it's high-density polyethylene, or another flexible waterproof material. 
It protects against mechanical damage, friction, and moisture. This is again done in an extruder, similar to the one where the first insulation layer was applied. The cable passes through molten polymer and immediately enters a cooling bath. After cooling, the cable enters the steel wire braiding section. Machines evenly lay steel rods or tapes in a spiral around the already insulated core. In shallow water areas, this armor is thicker to protect against anchors, fishing nets, and shark teeth. At depth, the armor is thinner or absent altogether. After reinforcement, another outer polymer sheath may be added, which seals the entire structure. Operators carefully inspect the cable surface, checking for uniform thickness, no abrasions, burrs, cracks, or armor misalignments. Then, automated tests. Lasers scan the thickness. Cameras capture every millimeter. Light pulses are sent through the fibers again. The signal must pass without delays or losses. If a defect is found at this stage, it is cut out and both ends are joined using a special technology, creating a sealed splice joint. After inspection, the cable enters the marking section. Here, information about the batch, production date, cable type, and its purpose is printed on the outer sheath, often every few feet, so it's easy to identify the cable even during laying on the seabed. And finally, winding onto spools. These are giant drums with a diameter of up to 13 or 16 feet, which can hold up to 8,200 feet of cable. Each turn must lie flat, without twists, and with uniform tension. Automatic systems regulate the speed and tension force, and operators monitor each stage. If the cable is intended for installation at sea, the drums are immediately sent to ships where they are installed on the deck. If not, they're stored in special warehouses with humidity control, because even minor corrosion can be fatal. Every year, over 27 billion square feet of drywall are produced in the United States. That's enough to build a road from the Earth to the Moon and almost halfway back or to cover the entire state of Delaware twice. But how does an ordinary stone, formed millions of years ago at the bottom of ancient seas, turn into the smooth sheets that become the walls of our homes today? In this video, we'll take a look behind the factory doors, where tons of stone pass through furnaces, mills, and conveyors to become the symbol of modern American construction. Watch until the end, and you'll see secrets that are rarely shown publicly. The numbers behind drywall production in the United States are not just big, they are astronomical. And they tell a story of how the country builds, renovates, and breathes. In a recent year, factories in the US produced approximately 27 billion square feet of gypsum board panels. This number is so colossal that it's hard to comprehend. Try to imagine, if you were to lay out all this amount of drywall, you could create a continuous three-foot-wide path that would stretch from the Earth to the Moon and almost halfway back. Or, with this number of sheets, you could completely cover the entire state of Delaware twice and still have some left over. This endless stream of building material is not only a physical product, but also a powerful economic indicator. The market for these panels in the U.S. is valued in the tens of billions of dollars, reflecting not just the cost of the material itself, but also thousands of jobs in mines and factories, in logistics and in construction. It all begins not in the workshop, but much earlier, in a quarry where gypsum is mined. This is a natural mineral, a stone that was formed millions of years ago from ancient seas. It can be white, grayish, sometimes with pink veins. Huge excavators dig into the gypsum deposits and load dump trucks with boulders of this stone. These trucks bring tons of gypsum to the factory and dump it onto the raw material yard, creating entire mountains waiting for their transformation. The first stage inside the factory is coarse crushing. The gypsum boulders fall into the giant steel jaws of the primary crusher. With a deafening roar and grinding, the machine breaks the large stones into smaller pieces the size of a fist. This is just the beginning. Then this crushed gypsum is fed by a conveyor belt to secondary mills. Here, 
dozens of steel hammers rotating at an insane speed, break these pieces into even smaller fractions, turning them into something resembling coarse gravel. But even this is not enough. The final stage of grinding turns the gypsum into a fine, powder-like dust. It becomes so fine that it resembles flour or dust. This powder is the main raw material, but it still hides a secret that needs to be revealed. The next step is one of the most important and interesting. It's a process called calcination, and essentially, it's the controlled drying of gypsum. The fact is that in the crystal structure of natural gypsum, water molecules are locked in. For drywall to harden, this water must be temporarily driven out. To do this, the white powder is fed into a huge, slowly rotating kiln. It looks like a giant drum tilted at a slight angle. Inside this kiln, a very precise temperature of about 300 degrees Fahrenheit is maintained. The gypsum powder, slowly tumbling inside the drum, heats up and the water bound to it turns into steam and evaporates. Chemically speaking, gypsum turns into calcium sulfate hemihydrate, but to put it simply, it becomes thirsty. Now this powder, which is already called building plaster or stucco, has a unique property. If you add water to it again, it will greedily absorb it and turn back into a hard gypsum stone. It is this property that is the basis of the entire production. The resulting hot powder is cooled and stored in giant silos resembling towers from where it will be fed to the main production line. And now the most spectacular part begins, the creation of the sheet itself. In the workshop is a huge conveyor, hundreds of feet long. At its beginning stand two giant rolls of special dense paper, or paperboard. One roll for the face side, it's perfectly smooth white. The other for the back side, it can be a bit darker, grayish. The ribbon from the bottom roll, the face side, is unwound and lays on the conveyor, forming an endless track. In parallel with this, in a giant mixer, resembling an industrial food processor, the core is prepared. Our thirsty gypsum powder, water, and a whole cocktail of various additives are continuously fed into it. Each additive plays its role. Foaming agents make the gypsum mass lighter and more porous, like whipped cream, to reduce the weight of the sheet. Plasticizers make the mixture more fluid, so it spreads evenly. Accelerators or retarders allow engineers to perfectly control the time it takes for the gypsum to set. Starch helps the gypsum core to stick better to the paper liner, and fiberglass adds strength. This mixture, called slurry, resembles a thick gray porridge. It is poured in a continuous stream directly onto the paper ribbon moving on the conveyor. Special devices evenly distribute this mass across the entire width of the paper. The edges of the bottom sheet of paper are neatly folded up, forming the sides of the future sheet. And at this moment, the second ribbon of paper, from the back roll, is laid on top like a lid. The result is an endless, perfectly even sandwich. Paper, gypsum mass, paper. This sandwich immediately passes between two rollers or under a forming plate, which compress it to a precisely specified thickness, for example, half an inch. The newly formed, still soft and damp sheet of drywall continues its journey on a very long conveyor called the setting line. Its length can reach several hundred feet while the sheet slowly moves, a real miracle is happening inside it. The gypsum powder reacts with water, the same rehydration reaction occurs. The gypsum turns back into a hard stone, releasing heat in the process. If you touch the sheet at the stage, it will be warm. In a few minutes, the loose mass becomes hard enough to hold its shape. At the end of this long line stands a flying knife. This is a huge blade that moves in sync with the belt and, at the right moment, makes a quick, precise cut, slicing the endless sandwich into sheets of standard length, for example, 8 or 12 feet. This happens so quickly that the conveyor doesn't stop for a second. 
The cut sheets are now hard, but still very damp. They contain excess water that did not participate in the chemical reaction. It needs to be removed. Therefore, a special device flips the sheets and feeds them into the most massive structure in the factory, a multi-deck dry-in kiln. This is a giant labyrinth consisting of several levels, each of which is a conveyor. The drywall sheets slowly move along these levels back and forth, traveling a path of several hundred feet inside this huge furnace. Hot air circulating inside gently evaporates the excess moisture from them. The temperature here is very carefully controlled. Only the free water needs to be removed without damaging the crystal structure of the gypsum itself. This process can take about an hour. At the exit of the dryer appears a product we are familiar with, a perfectly dry, light, and strong sheet of drywall. But this is not the end. The final stage is finishing. Two finished sheets are stacked face to face. Their edges are perfectly trimmed to be straight and clean. A paper tape with information about the manufacturer and product type is glued to the end. After this, robotic manipulators with superhuman precision and grace lift the finished sheets and stack them in perfectly even stacks on pallets. Each stack is wrapped in protective film, labeled, and sent to the warehouse. From there, it will go to construction sites to become part of someone's home, transforming from a simple gray stone mined from the earth into a smooth and cozy wall. Drywall production is like a barometer of the construction industry's health. When the economy is booming, people actively build new houses and renovate old ones, and the demand for drywall soars. The factories that produce this product operate at full capacity, and the stream of trucks delivering the finished sheets across the country becomes endless. The heart of this production beats in unison with the rhythm of the real estate market. Geographically, this industry also has its centers. Although drywall factories are located throughout the country to be closer to large construction markets, the extraction of the main raw material, gypsum, is concentrated in certain states. The leaders here are states like Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nevada, and Iowa.